Is this working? Good afternoon. Uh, I would advise you to come to the table. As you see, there is enough uh, room on the table. <laughs> and come, clo come close to us also, so it feels cozy and we can have a nice discussion just in, a, in this smaller group. Usually when you do the latest session of the day, it's only the super interested persons and the diehards in the room. So thank you for staying with us. We will uh, start in a couple of minutes. Thank you. All right, well, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for staying with us and, and uh, participating in this session on quantifying peace and conflict in uh, cyberspace. My name is uh, Serge Strobans, and I'm the director at the Institute for Economics and Peace for Europe, the Middle East, and Northern Africa. I am uh, joined in the panel today in a very distinguished and diverse panel today by uh, Mrs. Liga Rosenthalle, Microsoft Director of EU Policy on Cybersecurity and Security of Emerging Technologies, by Her Excellency Latha Reddy, Co-Chair of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace and also former Deputy National Security Advisor uh, of India, with Marilia Maciel, Senior Researcher at an, a Diplo Foundation, also a PhD candidate, and uh, we will have online uh, Mrs. Isabella Albrecht from the Kosciuszko Institute in Poland. What I will do is first introduce in more detail the panelists, uh, then I will give you an introduction about the Institute for Economics and Peace and our work in uh, measuring and quantifying peace and the Global Peace Index that we produce every year. And then we will shift it to a, a presentation on the panel about, uh, I would say, peace in, uh, in cyberspace. Um, and we will finish with uh, the floor and your questions and try to give the best answers to your questions. So I will start with Mrs. Liga Rosenthaler from uh, Microsoft, Microsoft that is together with the Institution for Economics and Peace, uh, presenting and proposing this uh, session to you. Uh, so I said to the Microsoft Director of EU Policy on Cybersecurity and Security of Emerging Technologies, you lead a team focusing on topics ranging from digital legislation and sovereignty to global cyber norms and multi-stakeholderism. Multi you also currently serve as a special advisor to the Latvian mission to the UN. You are a delegate for the open-ended working group on information and telecommunications in the context of international security. You also engage in Women for Cyber Advisory Committee, and you have been named by SC Magazine UK as one of the top 50 European women in cybersecurity for 2019, so congratulations for that. Um, you also bring to the role your experience as a counselor on the cybersecurity policy to the Latvian permanent representations to both the EU and 
the, and NATO in, in Brussels, and you chair the Council of the EU Working Parties on both te telecommunications and cybersecurity. You're also very enthusiastic about enhancing and energizing public-private partnerships or PPPs, facilitating the role of Microsoft in Europe and driving the future of cybersecurity policy in the EU and globally. We are really pleased to have you on the panel, Ms. Rosenthali. Your Excellency Lata Reddy, former Deputy National Security Advisor of India, where you were responsible for cybersecurity and other critical internal and external security issues. You also served as a Commissioner to the Global Commission on Internet Governance. You served the Indian Foreign Services until 2011. Uh, and this uh, career brought you to cities as Lisbon, and I just heard your fluency in Portuguese, Washington DC, Kathmandu, Brasilia, there again, Durban, Vienna, and Bangkok. After this uh, brilliant academic, uh, sorry, diplomatic career, uh, you were appointed as India's Deputy National Security Advisor in the Prime Minister's Office from 2011 to 2013. You have extensive experience in foreign policy, and in bilateral, regional, and multilateral negotiations. In addition, you have expertise on security and strategic issues, and you have worked on strategic technology policies, particularly on cyber issues relating to cybersecurity policy, international cyber cooperation, and internet governments. Third uh, person on the panel today would be Marilia Maciel. Uh, you are a digital policy senior researcher at Diplo Foundation. Previously, you were researcher and coordinator of the Center for Technology and Society of the Getulio Vargas Foundation in Rio de Janeiro. You serve as a counselor at ICANN's Generic Names Supporting Organization, representing the non-commercial stakeholder group. You are a former member of the Working Group of Improvements to the Internet Governance Forum in 2011 and 12, and also a member of the Multi-Stakeholder Executive Committee of Net Mundial. Uh, you have a PhD candidate at the University of bordeaux Montaigne on Information and Communication Sciences. Welcome also on the board. And then virtually, I would, I would say, through the net and connected to us, we have this is Isabella Albrecht, a political scientist who since 2010 has been chair of the Kosuko Institute. Since 2014, she's also the chair of the organizing committee of the European Polish Cybersecurity Forum, CyberSec, and since 2019, a member of the Council for Digitization, which, it, which is now in its third term, and she also chaired this committee in a second term between 2016 and 18. She is, she is also the associate editor of the European Cybersecurity Journal, and she has also been listed amongst the 100 Eastern Europe's emerging technology stars announced by the Financial Times and Europe, New Europe 100. In 2019, she became a founding member of the Women for Cyber Initiative by the European Cybersecurity Organization. She is an alumni, just as I am, of the International Visitor Leadership Program of the U.S. State Department in the scope of NGO management. So we are really pleased to have this, this panel around us. Uh, and let, please let me start to introducing this Institute for Economics and Peace. So we are um, a non-for-profit, apolitical, uh, an independent think tank based in Sydney, Australia. Uh, we do have representations throughout the world. I'm uh, directing the one in Brussels. We have another presentation in The Hague. Uh, in New York City, close to the UN, and then I would say linked to those regional offices, offices in Mexico City, where we also produce a Mexico Peace Index, and in Arar, Zimbabwe, where we are advising the local government. Uh, what we do is we measure and quantify peace, and also the economic benefits and the drivers of peace, and also the economic benefits linked to a more peaceful uh, situation. So next to the research that we produce, that is an, o an open source for uh, about peace. We also do consultancy for international organizations and we also try to promote the best we can or, uh, or work. So that's why we have a, a, a global outreach reaching between 7 and 10 billion a year. Uh, One billion of this uh, is, is uh, online. Uh, we are read in 150 countries, produce about 10 reports a year. Uh, and also very active in the ac academic environment. Uh, the Global Peace Index, which is our flagship uh, research pro uh, production or what we produce, uh, is based around 23 different indicators. 
Uh, so it's a very complex uh, index. Uh, these 23 indicators are divided in three families. One family is going to have a closer look on ongoing uh, domestic and international conflict and the implication of countries in those conflicts. A second family will look at uh, safety and security within societies. And a last uh, category or last family will look at levels of militarization, where when we look at the GDP invested uh, for defense, the percentage of GDP, we will look at arms, exports and imports, and we will also look at uh, the number of people working in the security services. There is also one positive indicator there, and this is the investment in uh, UN peacekeeping uh, operations. When we look at the results for the Global Peace Index 2019, we have globally seen an improvement by 0.09% of the levels of peace. So this might sound marginal, but in the last 11 years, it's only the third time that the world basically became more peaceful. Uh, overall, over the last decade, uh, we have had a regression by almost 4% of the levels of peacefulness globally, uh, the most peaceful region being still uh, Europe, and the, and the least peaceful region being the MENA region, so the Middle East and Northern Africa. We rank 163 countries, and this for the 13th time. Those countries reaching from Iceland, number one, until Afghanistan, who became uh, last on our index uh, this year. Unfortunately, um, Afghanistan is now at the bottom of all the indexes we produce, the Global Peace Index, Positive Peace Index, but also the Global Terrorism Index that we have been launching uh, last week. Uh, what we also see is a widening gap between the most and the least peaceful countries in the world. We have produced specific research also uh, on, uh, for example, climate change, where we see that uh, one billion people are living in uh, areas that are already affected or that will be soon affected by climate change. And we see that out of this billion, about 40% of so 400 million people are also living in a country that is ranked in the bottom 20 to 25 of our index. So we clearly see that in some geographical areas of the world, the factors influencing peace and security are just uh, combined and influencing or exacerbating their, their impact on those uh, countries. What we also do at the Institute for Economics and Peace is quantify the cost of violence. Uh, and we, we identified a, a figure of 14.1 trillion US dollars last year. Uh, uh, so about, and these 14.1 trillion, 75% are invested either in the military or in internal security, so to speak, police uh, services. Uh, so just imagine, uh, only the figure 14.1 trillion, it's, it's a very conservative figure, so I guess the reality is, it's, uh, would be much higher. But just imagine 14.1 trillion, this is already mind-blowing. Uh, if you, 1% of this amount represents the entire uh, foreign aid or foreign development budget globally. So if you would save 1% of the cost of violence, you could double your budget on, on development. So I think that's a very interesting uh, figure. If you would open that window to 10%, 10% of the cost of violence represents uh, global foreign, foreign direct investment. Uh, so next to this, next to identify the levels of peace, we also wanted to create um, a concept that would allow uh, countries so that would allow organizations to create peace, to maintain it and to, and to sustain and develop it and eventually get the economic benefits and we are able to also quantify the economic benefits that are linked to, most, to a more peaceful uh, society. This concept is called positive peace. It's based on a systemic approach to peace, so we see peace as a system and we don't really look at the causal effect uh, in, in our approach. Uh, what we have seen is that countries having a high level of positive peace will also get faster and stronger economic, social and government uh, returns, uh, returns of that, but also economic resilience. So basically, high levels of, le of uh, positive peace equals um, a more resilient and strong and inclusive society. So that's about uh, the introduction about how the Institute for Economics and Peace is quantifying peace. And I think it will be interesting later in the debate to see how we could uh, in include uh, what's happening in cyberspace into what we are measuring and what we are 
uh, classifying or ranking it as such. Uh, there, there is a double approach to this. So either you can create a completely new PCNX and identify new indicators, um, and our panelists will, will talk about this, or you can just adapt the existing PCNX that is already measuring the, the, the effects and the impacts of, of what's happening in cyberspace in, I would say, the offline uh, society. So I guess this will be the result of uh, future discussions of our panelists. We have asked three questions to a panelist, and I will just read those questions before opening the floor to uh, you, Miss uh, Your Excellency, if you would be available to speak as a first speaker. So the three questions that we have asked were, what are the current trends in cyber conflict today? And when I read this question, and one thing came to my mind, and this is the US cyber attack uh, on Iran, uh, that has been decided, I would say, 10 minutes before uh, kinetic effects would, uh, would strike, strike the country. And uh, I guess what we could think about this is that aren't we considering a cyber attack as the lesser evil in, in, in conflict today and that would replace a kinetic attack? Uh, the second question that we would ask ourselves is uh, what data indicators are there for cyber conflict? Uh, which ones are also relating to cybercrime, the development of cyber weapons, and uh, what is the legal framework for the use of cyberspace in, in combat? So we have seen, uh, I, mean, I can take the example of NATO, where since uh, 2014, we have seen that NATO has been identifying uh, acts in cyberspace or cyber attacks as potential Article 5, so collective defense. 2016, they have uh, identified cyberspace as the next battle space. So my question is, what is the legal framework around this? Do, are we going to apply the laws of armed conflict and discrimination and proportionality in the response? Do we need to, dis to, de to develop a new set of rules? I think that's a very interesting question for the panel today. And then the third uh, question, uh, what, is the, what role can civil society, SMEs, and the tech industry have in creating more peace in, in uh, cyberspace. And I guess this is where we will talk about those private-public partnerships and where we could maybe think about uh, which sector is most or has, have been, has been most impacted by uh, cyber attacks in the past. Is this the private sector and private companies or the public sector? And who has developed the experience that we could use now to provide an answer to the existing situation in cyberspace. So enough of me. I will come back for the Q&A leading the, the session, and I will uh, give the floor now to Her Excellency Ms. Uh, Mrs. Lata Rabi. Ready. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Serge, for that very comprehensive uh, introduction. Uh, now, you know, how do you measure peace, and what are the current trends in cyber conflict? In a sense, I'm going to conflate my answer by combining these two. Uh, why it's difficult to measure peace in cyberspace is because of issues that don't have much to do with cyber at all, you know, because you have a lack of trust. You have a breakdown of trust between uh, nations. You have a breakdown of trust between uh, stakeholders, whether it's government and private industry. Uh, you have geopolitical tensions that don't have really very much to do with cyber at times, but which then, in a sense, create a situation where one party is portrayed as the villain who is attacking, and the other is portrayed as an innocent victim. And the interesting thing is all countries portray themselves in this, in this light. Uh, the 20 or 30, the, among the estimations vary of countries that have nuclear, uh, sorry, cyber weapon capability, uh, would all argue that they've been victims of attacks. You know, there's no one country that says, I only attack. They would all argue, I've heard every single country say, my businesses are being attacked, my civil society users are being attacked, my public sector was attacked, uh, websites of the government have been attacked. Uh, frankly, uh, I think in a situation like that, it's very difficult to talk about trends in cyber conflict without talking about what's happening 
offline. And there I would agree with Serge that uh, we would need to talk about offline and online uh, together to a certain extent. Um, I think that cybercrime and weapons, which was another area that you uh, mentioned, uh, cybercrime again, some people would argue that some cybercrime is state inspired. Some would argue that it's by organized criminal gangs. You also have the problem of the deep dark web. Uh, and you have non-state actors obviously carrying out a lot of cyber criminal uh, attacks. Uh, you have the use of cyberspace for, by terror groups, by extremist groups. You have the need for countering violent extremism online. And of course, you have the most recent phenomenon, which is min misinformation, fake news, influence operations. And I think basically from my point of view, I see it as both a national problem and an international problem. For instance, I've seen in many countries where there's acute polarization between political groups or groups that support different points of view. Uh, the attacks are within your own country. You don't have to look outside for cyber conflict. There's cyber conflict within the country. And therefore, how are you going to measure the, the peace index within a national context? It's easier to compare two countries, but how would you then create an index that also looks at how peaceful a country is in cyberspace in their own territory or among users in their own space? Attribution is one of the big problems because you can't always prove who has launched the attack or who has launched the misinformation. We're getting there. There is now reasonably certain attribution possible by certain advanced systems. But I don't think we've received really a 100% convincing proof. And so everybody who claims to have attributed an attack has not very often actually proved conclusively where the attack has originated from. And I think for data indicators that you would use, uh, one, you would have to quantify the number of attacks. Your problem there is going to be that a lot of attacks are not disclosed. In the case of companies, they are worried about their bottom line, about the reputation of the company. They may not really want to reveal that so much information has been hacked. Usually it comes about uh, because there's a whistleblower or the, the, there is a feeling of responsibility towards the users of that company's products that people would come out with it. Governments would not want a loss of confidence in their own government structure. They may conceal the fact that they've come under attack. Um, I think the question is also you would have to examine the resilience of each country to cyber attacks. And by that I mean the ability to protect and the ability to bounce back after an attack. Uh, firstly, do you prevent attacks? How good is your system for preventing attacks? Secondly, how good is your system for reacting to an attack? These were the questions we grappled with all the time in, uh, in national security. And what are your organizations and mechanisms which actually exist within that country and globally for measuring data in cyberspace? Uh, and I think government data and industry data is certainly incomplete. I think there are a lot of people who are subject to cyber attacks, very minor ones maybe, where you're uh, swindled out of a few thousand rupees or a few hundred dollars online, who are just embarrassed to come forward and report it because they realize they shouldn't have done what they did, whether it was click on an attachment or answer a mysterious letter offering you millions of dollars if you will only share your bank account details. Um, I think people are embarrassed to say that they were gullible enough to, uh, to fall for that. And you have the problem in developing countries like mine, where you know people don't see the danger in sharing PIN numbers. They don't see the danger 
in having one ATM card to service a whole family. Uh, and uh, they don't know really that they need to have a password. The most common password, and this I must say is not just uh, people who have not been educated, uh, the most common password is 1234 or 0000. zero, zero, zero. And you would be able to crack most accounts just using those uh, combinations. So it's a question of how are you going to educate people on cyber safety to prevent cyber attacks. And so you've got every level, you know, you've got the level of the average user where, you know, what happens when they get attacked, what happens to private companies, what happens to public sector companies, and finally, what happens to governments itself when they get uh, attacked. And I think the argument about an, a, a cyber attack being less physically damaging than a kinetic attack is not really very convincing to my mind because it depends on what you attack. If you attack a hospital and you destroy health data, you can actually cause harm, physical harm to a great number of uh, people. If you attack the national grid or you attack transport, imagine if all the air traffic controllers in the world were attacked. Uh, you would have complete chaos with planes smashing into each other mid-air. So just because it hasn't happened doesn't mean the potential for uh, attacking systems will not have disastrous consequences. Unfortunately or fortunately, we haven't faced the terrible cyber incident that has been forecast for so many years and which people felt would frighten people into regulating this, uh, this space. Uh, but it does not mean that the potential does not exist. And I think the role of civil society is very big. That's why we're here at the Internet Governance Forum, because we understand that cyber is essentially a multi-stakeholder model, that it cannot be governed by, just by governments, that we need every kind of stakeholder to come in to talk about this. And my professional background, as you heard, was diplomacy. And I would argue that without dialogues, without sharing of information, without sharing of best practices, we cannot really make cyberspace more peaceful. Because ultimately, what is the goal of having a peace index? The goal of having a peace index is to show where best practices have prevailed, who has been most successful at creating an atmosphere of peace in, uh, in uh, cyberspace? And how do we ensure that that same model is followed? So my own feeling is that efforts, you know, one of the things I've been very busy with recently is working as co-chair of the Global Commission on Cyber Stability. And we have come up with specific norms, we've come up with specific recommendations, and our recommendations talk about the need for both restraint and for action. Restraint from doing the bad things, take action to do the good things. Respond to violations, make people face the consequences. And capacity building for cyber stability, information sharing on violations and their impact build communities of interest around implementing different ways to ensure cyber peace, and have a standing multi-stakeholder engagement mechanism. We put out specific norms saying the infrastructure of cyberspace should not be interfered with. And our goal, as it is your goal, is how do we create a path forward to lasting cyber peace? So I'm talking to you as a diplomat, not as a technical person. We don't create indexes in the Global Commission. We simply have made suggestions to bring more peace into this sphere. But uh, uh, I, I look forward to a very active interaction because we have uh, technical experts from industry and other agencies from the Diplo uh, Foundation, which in many ways, I think, Kamarilia, you and I would be talking about the same thing, but perhaps in a different uh, language. And um, 
I would leave it there for now, and I'm, I'm happy to talk to you more about some of the ideas I've developed. But it's hard to create peace offline, and it's hard to create peace online, is all I can end with. Thank you. Well, Your Excellency, thank you very much for uh, this very interesting uh, opening statement. I think you spoke about uh, the difficulties to measure the influence uh, between offline and online communities, what means offline and, and uh, online world. Uh, you spoke about different type of crimes using, using uh, cyberspace for their activities. Uh, I would say terror or terrorism, cyber terrorism being one of those, those crimes really at the heart of the debate today. You spoke about difficulty to attribute, but also the, the secrecy and the silence about, uh, from those being attacked uh, and so sometimes being ashamed of uh, having been a victim of, of cyber crime or a cyber attack. Um, you, you also spoke, you compare a little bit the, the effects of a kinetic attack and a, and a cyber attack. And, and in the examples you gave, I think when, we, when you spoke about, about uh, the transportation, you spoke about the airports and the air traffic, but I, I think we all know that uh, Marsk as a company has been, has been attacked and their lines of communication have been disrupted for a couple of weeks, a couple of years ago, and the, the national health services in the UK have yes. been targeted also, and, and we saw the, the, the results of, of these type of, uh, of attacks. You also pointed out that the solution won't, comes, won't come from government alone, uh, so it will be a multi-stakeholder approach, which is, I guess, an evolution of the Westphalian order as we know it today, where states were holding all the power to solve all the problems of our societies. And you, you I think uh, you are right to point out that this won't be the, 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 a potential solution, a potential situation for cyberspace. And you finished, of course, by uh, talking about uh, your organization, the Global Commission, and the actions that you are taking. And I guess the last point you made is that cyberspace is only one form of peace that we will find back in this bigger system called peace. Thank you very much. So I would like to uh, pass the floor now to our uh, second panelist, and if that's okay with you, uh, Mariela Maciel, I will give you uh, the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Serge, and thank you for the invitation to be in the panel And Lata is right. I think we're going to go in a similar direction, perhaps from slightly different approaches. Uh, the first question was about trends that we see now in cybersecurity and when we talk about peace in cyberspace. I think the first complication to achieve uh, peace in cyberspace is that we have a situation of multipolar distribution of capabilities. Although we do emphasize a lot the capabilities that the US and China uh, have when it comes to cyberspace, um, we conducted a research on states that openly say that they have offensive capabilities to conduct an attack, and we counted more than 50 states uh, today that openly affirm that. So we have a situation in which capabilities are distributed, and of course that creates a situation of instability uh, in the whole system. The second trend is the dissemination of the technology. Not only states possess technologies to conduct attacks, but we see that non-state actors more and more have access to these technologies because the prices have come down um, immensely. So they are uh, available in the dark web and other spaces. If you want to conduct a DDoS attack, you can rent a botnet for 200, 300 euros, and it's simple to do that. So there's a dissemination of capabilities to non-state actors as well. Um, the other trend is that we still are unclear about the applicability of international law. We know that international law applies to cyberspace that has been internationally recognized, uh, although we are still building consensus on the international arena of how international law will actually apply to cyberspace, what are the contours, what are the limitations. So we are in a situation in which the legal framework in which we operate is still gaining shape. Um, another trend that I think is uh, very important is that we have a blurring of lines that separate the traditional and cyber operations. So we have seen uh, concrete examples in which uh, states have responded to cyber attacks with kinetic attacks. Um, uh, Israel responded to a, a cyber attack coming from the Hamas uh, with destroying a bombarding a building where the, the suspected cyber attack was located. Uh, in the other hand, 
the US launched a cyber attack to respond to the fact that Iran has shot a drone down. So we see a blurring of lines and, and this can lead to, to a situation of escalation uh, of tensions. Um, so that complicates the problem um, as well and creates a situation of more um, cyber insecurity. So these are some of the trends in which we operate when we talk about cyber security and cyber peace. Um, in this situation, it's very important that we have measurements because I think that Lata was really correct when she points out that when we have measurements, then we are encouraging and countries and actors to follow a positive path. They have a framework, they have a model, they have something that they can um, follow, of course, adjusting to their own uh, realities. The problem is that what data is publicly available for us to develop uh, uh, metrics of peace in cyberspace? First of all, we don't have a clear definition of what are the relevant data sources. Um, this is something that we are still building consensus uh, um, about, because when we talk about uh, cybersecurity, we do have some metrics for cybersecurity that have been developed by different organizations, um, the ITU for example, uh, publishes the Global Cybersecurity Index. Uh, they have some indicators that include you know, the presence of uh, cybercrime laws, the presence of certs, um, the presence of a national cybersecurity strategy in the country, awareness raising initiatives, initiatives of professional development, um, participation in international fora, and partnerships between the public and the private sector. But this is very specific to cybersecurity. If we enlarge the analysis to cyber peace, uh, it, is, it's, it is much more encompassing. We need to take into account um, societal elements that would need uh, to be identified so we have the correct indicators. And I think that the work that has been developed by institutes the Institute for Economics and Peace, um, is very good to point us perhaps in a direction that we could take inspiration from and adapt to a, to a situation of peace in, in, in cyberspace. One of the elements uh, that you develop in your metrics is to take into account freedom of information. And this is something that unfortunately we still don't have clear answers in international law. You also asked us about what are the legal frameworks in which we operate when we talk about uh, cyber peace. And we do have some, some legal frameworks that are present. present. We have uh, Jus ad bellum that says the situations in which a country can resort um, to the use of force, self-defense, uh, when it is authorized by the UN Security Council. Uh, we know that humanitarian laws apply to cyberspace, but when it comes to freedom of information and access to information, perhaps we are operating in a more um, complicated area because now we have the problem of disinformation. And we don't have uh, today clear international laws that would apply uh, to this information and more particularly to the problem that we have very acute today of interference um, in elections. Um, so we had a session in this very room uh, in the morning and we were trying to understand what are the applicable uh, legal frameworks and we do have principles that relate to misinformation um, such as sovereignty, and non-interference in internal affairs of states. Um, however, they do not necessarily uh, completely adjust to the situation of, of misinformation. So we are operating um, in a field in which we don't have a, a clear uh, legal framework. So I think that is another point that brings complexity. Your question about the role um, of different uh, actors is a very important one. Um, I think that the first thing to bear in mind is that cybersecurity is a joint responsibility. We have fortunately started to move away from the assumption that security is the prerogative of states. This is not possible when we think about cybersecurity. It's not the state that controls, um, first of all, much of the infrastructure that allows the internet to function from the the cables that interconnect uh, continents to the applications that we use to communicate. Therefore, it will be impossible to talk about cybersecurity and, and cyber peace without involving non-state actors, uh, including um, uh, companies. So I believe that the tech industry has a very um, important role to play in this scenario by raising security standards. Uh, some security standards are still low when we think about Internet of Things, 
Um, when we think about the, the, the need to rush and put products in the market, sometimes without um, the due care, um, with, a, with a system of patch and pray, we put the product out there. If there is a problem, then we are going to patch afterwards, but sometimes the problem already happened and the damage is done. So there is a duty of care that needs to be um, observed. But I think that the tech industry has also um, taken a lot of the responsibility of trying to push the international discussion um, forward. Um, some years ago, when we talked about the industry, they were really adamant against governmental regulation um, in many areas on the internet. And now we see that different companies are calling for regulation in areas in which regulation is necessary, um, such as uh, misinformation um, or uh, uh, um, uh, facial recognition. So there is, there is a call for more partnership between this, this uh, initiative from the private sector and governmental regulation. Um, and I think uh, small and medium-sized companies, they are not really mentioned um, in this debate, but they are an important key of the, of the, of the chain, or element of the chain. First of all, we need to help them to have more, uh, more access to, to security tools um, because they compose more than 90% of companies in many of our countries. I, I heard someone from Germany saying that 99% you know, of, of the, the scenario of companies in Germany are small and medium-sized companies. So we really need to invest on in security um, um, for these companies and they need help uh, and assistance and to, to have access to, to good practices. So we cannot only focus on the big ones, but make sure that we include smaller ones as well. And of course, civil society um, has a big role to play, not only in taking responsibility for their own cyber hygiene, but also demanding uh, higher standards of security, demanding certification from governments, and offering capacity building, which I think that civil society has played a very important role in developing in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very uh extensive uh, introduction, I would say. Uh, you clearly spoke about the distribution of capabilities and dissemination and easy access and financially ac accessible technology. You also spoke about the quality of international law. Uh, okay, it applies, but how do you apply it to, uh, to cyberspace? Uh, we will be responsible. Um, just to give an example about, about NATO, when they declare Article 5, when you take the Treaty of Washington, it says, uh, collective defense after an armed attack. So, the cyber, what's happening in Spire, does it fit this definition of 1949, for example? Um, you also spoke about the separation between traditional conflict or traditional uh, tactics and procedures and, and cyber. Uh, can it be identified as a facilitator, as a force multiplier, as it is called? Uh, is it shaping the, uh, the physical battle space before ba the physical battle space is going to, uh, to be used? And what will be the role then of, of those different stakeholders, not only the state that you have seen having the prerogative of security in this physical battle space in which as you spoke about blur lines, cyber technology will be used uh, also. I think um, I do have to agree with you that measurement will be, will be difficult, but that's what we're working on. So, of course, we need a clear definition that will allow us to collect data and also to identify the indicators that we will fit with this, uh, with this data. And, and I think a, a good exercise would be to look at, you know, the three families of indicators that I spoke of before, where we take the positive piece, looking at creating a better resilient society, uh, how would cyberspace uh, interact with the eight pillars of positive peace that we have identified where free, free flow of information is one of those. Um, you spoke about uh, the tech industry, not only the big ones, but also the SMEs and their roles and responsibility and, and of course, uh, the evolution of their position from opposing any governmental, uh, I would say, rules in cooperating today. And I would, I would think that the initiative by President Macron last year at the Paris Peace Forum calling for more multi-stakeholderism and identifying tech companies as potential first responders in, in conflict uh, was one of the first steps in this direction. So I don't know if we have a connection now with uh, Mrs. Albrecht in, in Poland, and we could uh, have her as a third person intervening in this panel uh, through, through Zoom. Is this possible? Oh, 
There we go. Hello. I can, I can hear, hear you. you. Oh, you oh. can hear me. Very good. Okay. okay. Please, Please go, go go ahead with your uh, intervention. All right. Thank you so much, uh, first of all, for um, inviting me. Uh, I actually spent the last couple of days in Halifax, Canada, and this is one of the reasons why I was not able to join you today in Berlin. Um, I will start by saying that it is great to continue the discussion, which we also held during uh, CyberSec 2018 on the positive piece in cyberspace. Um, ladies and gentlemen, conflicts between states have taken now new forms uh, with digital technologies uh, that are being used uh, in cyberspace. Um, the Ukrainian Minister of Defense said at the Halifax International Security Forum um, a few days ago that last year Ukraine have faced a large number of cyber attacks which indeed affected economy and well-being of its citizens. So hybrid history, he said, is being written every day with cyber attacks taking place every day without naming and shaming here. Um, he said that we cannot ignore it uh, because there are attacks on critical infrastructure and information attacks on people's minds, opinion, perception. This way, the chaos is created and chaos is far away from peace. And it is in this something which should be also reflected in the global peace index results. So I would probably support this notion to adapt the indicators that you are using to assess the uh, peace around the globe. Um, so, and it might be confusing to see that Ukraine is one of the country which uh, um, which um, um, you presented as a major, um, as a country with major increase in peace, when in fact uh, the battles that we cannot see uh, are happening. So, index now sees less tanks, ships, planes, soldiers being active, but it doesn't uh, see those battles that are happening in cyber and information space in. Ukraine, for instance, um, but they are also taking place uh, all around the world as we speak. And I'm saying that because we should not only talk today in reference to the Global Peace Index on how to measure the positive peace in cyberspace, but also we should talk about the way um, how to see the impact of cyber battles and potential cyber war on uh, global Peace. And indeed, we should talk about updating probably and upgrading uh, the GPI with cyber uh, dimension. And according to the book, um, New Rules of War, and I will now answer the question about how the cyber conflicts and cyber and conflicts look um, uh, like today and what are the trends. So according to the book, uh, New Rules of War by um, uh, Sean McFaid, um, modern war is more and more about political warfare, strategic influence, lawfare, economic might, deception and propaganda, and less about conventional weapon and uh, military deterrence. Mike McFaid is saying that in information age, plausible deniability is more potent than firepower and uh, is calling these new types of wars, shadow wars. And cyber attacks with different magnitudes and proxy cyber warfare are all about plausible deniability as they are hard to attribute as we already said also at this session. And so maybe we should try to find the right indicators, both qualitative and quantitative, as well as weights to be added to the GPI uh, methodology. Because cyber attacks on critical infrastructure, even though they are classified as being below the threshold of war, example, uh, for example, on transportation systems, waterworks, hospitals, and power plants, can lead to consequences and especially the knock-on effects, which would be just as devastating as in an attack with conventional weapons when supply chain, chains or the 
a transportation system would break down. And in terms of on how to quantify it, um, James Andrew Lewis from CSIS said, questions persist as to the appropriate framework for considering this new mode of conflict. But to a degree, uh, these questions uh, results from weak data, imprecise uh, terminology, and a certain reluctance to abandon uh, the notion that cyber conflict is unique and sweep generis, rather than being just another new technology applied to warfare. And uh, it is uh, correct that there is a need to identify precise indicators. Uh, it is also correct to know to call every bad thing that happens on the internet war or attack. So the thresholds for war or attack should not be very different in a cyberspace than they are for physical uh, activity. We can also focus dimension by defining cyber war as the use of force to cause damage, uh, destruction, um, or uh, casualties for political effect by state or political groups. So a cyber attack would be an individual act intended to cause damage, destruction, or, cas or casualties. There are also a gray area, uh, says uh, Luis, when we think about disruption, particularly the disruption of services and data, and when this uh, disruption is, uh, raises the level of the use of force. So the threshold uh, should be very high for calling a disruptive activity an act of war, um, of attack. So what would be uh, hard work to do for researchers, experts, and stakeholders to work on those indicators, um, but it is necessary to do it. So until now, we haven't observed any full-blow uh, cyber war, uh, neither the actual casualty, but uh, quite a few state-backed cyber incidents launched since uh, 2007. And you also mentioned one quite recent example. Um, and those attacks have different uh, objectives and magnitudes and should be perceived as disruptive for uh, the global peace. Um, so as we cannot ignore uh, the fact that cyber weapons are in many ways as dangerous and inhuman uh, as uh, chemical, biological weapons, we can observe a militarization of cyberspace with new technologies that uh, have a potential to become hard power for state actors, but also can be used by non-state actors, as was also mentioned today. So we can see also trends to impose arms control in cyberspace, which actually means that, again, we have a problem. Um, and we can observe then that the convergence trend uh, of total physical and digital spheres, uh, with, which soon will make our world even more uh, vulnerable to connectivity. Uh, this trend includes also the convergence of cyberspace and outer space. Outer space is vulnerable to cyber incidents too, and it is one of the concerns uh, which uh, is quite uh, uh, highlighted by uh, cybersecurity experts. Uh, both outer space and cyberspace now becoming new dimensions of military actions also for NATO. Um, as, as for today, one is for sure crystal clear, there are cyber threats and disinformation and manipulation um, amplify the risk of conflict, social, economic, military, and deteriorate peace. Uh, we then should work on uh, GPI methodology uh, to make it prepared to see those emerging threats. We need to update and upgrade the index indicators because peace is also determined by cyberspace. And maybe I can add to some proposals done already but by Ms. Latia Reddy, um, so a part of number of cyber incidents, we 
can also measure number of cyber crimes, number, number of cyber attacks, number of internet shutdowns that country experience, then we should also think about the indicators to measure gravity of cyber attacks. Um, then we can measure number of data breaches, and I would separate that category because data is now the most valuable resource, and we should take a closer look, look on it, also on the graffiti of data breaches. Another um, uh, indicator might be the likelihood of being the country of origin of cyber attack. Of course, after the public attribution or um, different levels of certainty that it happened. Uh, then another indicator may be number of uh, conventional reactions to cyber attacks, uh, for instance, economic sanctions, tariff, diplomatic uh, measures. Then maybe cyber military expenditure uh, as a percentage of GDP. Uh, again, maybe number of disinformation articles, campaigns, websites, uh, fake uh, accounts uh, identified, um, and the outreach of disinformation articles, campaigns, websites, fakes, uh, fake uh, accounts identified. Uh, it's gravity uh, and importance of the subject for economic, social, uh, stability, then likelihood of being the country of origins of this information after the public uh, attribution again, uh, or uh, uh, the, the different levels of certainty or number of bots identified or uh, the financial links. Uh, uh, so basically, I think that we can divide those uh, uh, the, the, these categories into like for instance, three baskets, which is economic, technical, uh, political. We should also start with some uh, taxonomy and clear, um, clear definitions. And uh, if I may add something, or I should maybe finish, just let me know, but I have like probably a uh, few more points to add uh, in terms of uh, the role of uh, stakeholders. Um, excuse, excuse me, can you maybe just on. like uh, uh, name the points but not elaborate on them? Would be fine. Yeah, yeah, Thank, yeah. You. Thank you. So maybe we, we are fine. Thank you very much. So you, you're done? <laughs> Did you Did finish? You finish? Yeah. Yeah. I, guess I guess so. All right. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. You clearly spoke about uh, new rules of conflict in which, of course, cyberspace and, and cyber capabilities were, uh, were used. Uh, it's, you spoke about political warfare, a new type of warfare. You spoke a lot about definition and potential indicators, militarization of cyberspace. You identified it as hard power uh, for state actors and non-state actors. You even spoke about arms control in, in cyberspace. You clearly make a link, and I think that's very important also with outer space or space as being another battlefield, recognized battlefield, and then the link with cyberspace is really uh, almost easy to understand. And then you elaborate it uh, eventually on the potential uh, indicators that could be used in a uh, digital peace index, or at least a peace index with a digital focus. We will now close this session and give the floor to uh, Ms. Liga Rosenthaler from Microsoft, the other organizer of this session, who will wrap up this session and also provide us with her remarks. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. With so many uh, very in-depth remarks, I think that I can shortly conclude uh, this session with, with just some thoughts that I had in preparation for this session and just to see where we would end up when I actually uh, get a word in edgewise. But uh, that's, that's uh, one marker of a successful panel when there's, when there's too much to say. In any case, I looked at the Global Peace Index and thought about how it could be elaborated to include some elements of technology, some developments that definitely impact peace because it's easy to count tanks, but it's not necessarily so easy to understand what affects peace uh, when you look at the tech technology technology and developments of e-government and, and uh, cyber offensive capabilities as well. So when 
I, I represent Microsoft, so I look at what Microsoft does. And we are a global company, and we have a far reach uh, in looking at threats. We detect 5 billion cybersecurity threats a month, and we assess 6.5 trillion signals daily. Does this statistic tell you if there's more peace in the world? Not particularly over the course of years. You can say that there's more attacks. We detect more signals. We try to do more to avert these attacks, but it doesn't necessarily indicate what happens to peace. So one thing, great thing about the IGF is that you can get your hands on tons of reports. So I've got all sorts of reports here, and I looked through them to see if I could find statistics that also uh, give us some indication if technology influences peace. Um, this Global State of Democracy report tries to quantify peace with different measurements, and it uh, becomes, in my quick evaluation, looking at how new technologies influence democracy, it's inconclusive. It provides opportunities, but it also provides threats and brings up vulnerabilities. So that didn't get me far. I looked into a website I heard about this morning called EU versus disinformation dot EU, which is an online report that has running numbers about disinformation. For instance, 6,500 foreign Twitter accounts promoted the Labour Party in the last UK general elections. That's, that's, that's interesting, and clearly we could draw some implications about that. Um, also, for instance, the Russian federal budget uh, for 2020 shows that state-owned media will receive 1.3 billion euros next year, which is a big jump from current funding. Some of us may have opinions about um, government-funded Russian media. Will this influence peace? Uh, I'm not sure. This tells us that influence campaigns are definitely taking place, but how do they... How do they influence peace? Also, military numbers might tell us something, like approximately 120 countries have been developing ways to use the Internet as a weapon, but have they been successful in increasing or reducing peace? In any case, these are various numbers. We can go on. We can look at uh, the new UN resolution on uh, cybercrime that received uh, the majority support, but also Many argue that such a, such a measure will um, just uh, influence state-backed internet control. One thing that we are very passionate about is the Paris call for trust and stability in cyberspace. And while we have enthusiastically counted the number of endorsers, which reaches over a thousand endorsers from government, civil society, and um, industry, the number alone is not what will, will uh, influence peace. It will be the actions taken to implement the nine principles of the Paris call, I think, that will bring about peace. That's unfortunately not so easily uh, quantifiable, so I suggest you look at uh, quantitative measures for your next Global Peace Index that will uh, influence peace and um, how technology feeds into that. So I'll quickly close my remarks, and I really appreciate having the opportunity to even briefly uh, touch on these points. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for being brief. I think it's, it's appreciated. Uh, I mean, uh, of course, presented to you a complex index on 23 indicators, three families. So we do much more than just count tanks, although it's a part in the family called militarization. Uh, and maybe to uh, enhance what you just said, and, and of course, I took the remark about uh, Ukraine uh, being one of, one of the large, largest improvements last year. Uh, but of course, what's happening on in cyberspace today will have an impact, but may, maybe not a direct impact, but this will be measured, I would say, on the more mid and, and longer term where levels of peace will, will uh, go down. We have seen in the past decade that the only family of uh, indicators that where we, see, where we saw a clear decrease was the family militarization. So even if you have this idea, especially in the West, that we are weaponizing, you know, with this 2% debate at NATO and, and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, militarization again or creating a European army, globally we are going down uh, with these figures. Um, clearly you have seen that cyberspace has the potential to destabilize because the force ratio and maybe balance and deterrence can be influenced by the development of capabilities in, in cyberspace. And the only thing from uh, IAP perspective or Institute for Economic, Economics and Peace perspective is that we are actively continuing the research, trying to find those indicators, the data sets, the definitions that we need to, to have to develop uh, a, a peace index that has a focus on, on cyberspace. And we were the first one to sign the first uh, the Paris call in Oceania, so we will always remember that also. We are quite late after, but I think that the, 
the, the interventions were quite uh, extensive and really went into the details of what we wanted to discuss before. So if there is like one, one uh, questions that you really need to ask, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, I would also be pleased to, uh, to close this very interesting session and thank, as I said in my opening remarks, this very distinguished and uh, diverse panel. And I was, it was really an honor and a privilege to moderate this, uh, your intervention. So thank you very much. Any incredible questions we need to answer? <laughs> Yeah, there is one volunteer, or we take one question and then we go from there. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your remarks. My name is Kyle. I am a cybersecurity researcher at the University of California, San Diego. And I would like to make a very provocative thought right now. Uh, one of the problems that we usually face when we are trying to understand cyber and how cyber will actually affect political science and because we are actually at the intersection between these two major scholarships, is uh, the definition of outcomes. Uh, let, what, I, what I'm trying to say is basically when we see, for example, an economic intervention, we can m see, we can measure, and we can actually touch the outcomes, and that's why there are a thousand papers on, on different kinds of interventions. And one of the biggest problems that we see in cyber is that, and this is our discussion there, which is, the outcome for cyber is not clearly defined. For example, uh, some states, like for example the United States, actually considers a scan, a simple scan, as a cyber attack. Others don't. And my, my question to you, it's basically the following. Do you really believe that this is one of the problems that we are facing when we're trying to tackle, like for example, measures or reliable measures uh, when it comes to cyber? Or do you think this is just academics trying to be perfect and at the end of the day, they're looking for stars and anything of the sort? Thank you very much. So you're free to engage with, with us after the session. I, I guess we will still be around. But we need to close the session because there are still more uh, sessions to come or activities afterwards. So we will answer this question and then uh, we will wrap up this, uh, this discussion. So who wants to go first on the question we received? I think the question was uh, that all attacks can't be classified equally. Like some countries are saying even a very simple scam is an attack, right? Is that no, what you said? What I'm said? saying is basically that since there's not a consensus on what kind of outcome we are looking for, yeah. we're still, we have problems trying to understand what, what the problems are in, in, in essence. Like for example, are we looking at hacks? Are we looking at data breaches? How are you going to measure data breaches? How are you going to measure hacks? How are you going to look at all these, these things that are going on? And how can we translate that into policy, into, into action, basically? So basically, if it had, hasn't caused substantial harm, can it be classified as a cyber attack, right? Like, is there a definition of what constitutes an actual cyber attack, is what you're saying? Well, I don't think there is a, a definition, but I'll, uh, what do you think, Liga? I'll quickly comment on the uh, view from Brussels. Uh, since I, I work in Brussels and look at EU legislation on cybersecurity, this is a bit of a, an, we have an easier framework to look at since we have EU legislation on cybersecurity through the Network Information Security Directive. And that uh, assigns all EU member states to define what a uh, attack of significant impact is. Then 28 member states had to impose this legislation and define for themselves what is an attack of significant impact that digital service providers need to report to a competent authority on. And I, this is, I mean, it, it, only uh, it only supports your point that it's difficult to determine what we're even looking at because even with legislation and uh, definitions of uh, an attack of significant impact, it's, it's still difficult to determine what meets this criteria and what doesn't because if you put financial indicators on it, what are you counting? If you put a, a scope of users, what kind of users, and how, uh, how do you define the user, how many people you're looking at, within what geographic location, it's quite difficult. 
So I don't have an answer to your question. I know in the EU we try to define these things through legislation, but it's, uh, it's, it's quite difficult. Well, I think the, the, the easy answer to your difficult question would be that uh, what's happening is uh, cyber insecurity, let's call it like this, is a global problem that needs uh, <laughs> global solutions. And, and therefore, I think it would be a good idea to create a global digital peace index, or at least identify uh, a definition, indicators, and data sets that we could use to, to feed the indicators. And by saying so, I wish you all uh, a good evening. I think there is one more day tomorrow at, uh, at this, well, for this forum, or even two more days, I guess. So I will have to leave Berlin tonight, and I guess some of us will have to leave Berlin tonight also. So we need to go and take the Uber back to, to the airport also. Uh, but we will be around for a couple of minutes more, so you have uh, really those burning questions. Please come and visit us. Thank you again to the panelists. Thank you to the, to the audience. And I would say fight for peace anywhere, not only in cyberspace. Thank you very much. <laughs>